Great. Thanks very much, Bill. So my chosen topic today is, uh, is rolling out IoT always this hard? Or, or why is it always this hard? Uh, just to introduce myself, I've been involved in connected innovation for most of my life. I've worked in startups all my life, actually. And uh, for the last 20 years, I've been starting uh, connected product companies. I started a company called Antenova, which has shipped billions of antenna systems. You've probably got some in your phones. And my previous startup to this one was called Alert Me, where we built uh, what became uh, Hive from British Gas. So in a uh, nearly 10-year journey for me, uh, we deployed eventually millions of devices into homes in the UK and the US. And we learned an awful lot about that journey, that scaling journey. And in particular, we learned that about the challenges of, of managing devices once they're deployed. And in fact, that's, that's a problem which can get bigger and bigger as you scale. And it's certainly something that's worth giving thought to. So that's really why we started my current company, Device Pilot. That's what Device Pilot does. It helps companies with connected products in any uh, vertical market to manage those devices and therefore deliver the service to their customers. So what is so hard about IoT? I mean, you do hear a lot of people who come new to the subject ask, ask that question. Uh, they say, how hard can it be? It's not rocket science. And it's true that if you zoom into any one part of an IoT solution, it's actually not that hard. It's fairly easy to understand. I think a lot of the complexity comes from the fact that IoT, any IoT solution is a chain of technologies. There are many, many different moving parts for a complete IoT solution. There's a lot to go wrong. The propos propositions themselves are new, especially startups coming into the space, launching completely new propositions to, to their customers. And it may take a time to sort of work out exactly what those propositions should be. There are lots and lots of different technologies involved, um, and those technologies are changing a lot of the time, lots of different standards and so on. Uh, and increasingly, as you can see from the show today, there are lots and lots of players in the market. So lots of new vendors appearing with pieces of the solution. And all of this is, is changing extremely rapidly. So if you're a, a CEO or a CTO trying to plan your way through this, it's really very complicated and fast changing. So I think how I'd like to reframe the question is really, um, how can we use all of this to our advantage rather than seeing it as a problem? And I'll come back to that question at the end. So if I think about the gating factors that tend to inhibit the, the growth and success of any IoT company, then to me, it's really one of three things usually. It's either the proposition, which means, uh, you know, if you don't have product market fit, uh, then, then that's going to cause a problem. Your customers are not getting their needs met perfectly by your proposition. Or it's the technology, particularly around scaling. Technology can often struggle as you start to scale and, and you find that its performance suffers. Or, or it's sales. Uh, you're finding it hard to find customers or hard to, um, to sell to them and close them. Or, or you're finding pricing hard. And actually, the topic of pricing is one that uh, I increasingly hear people talk about. There are lots of different business models in IoT, complex value chains, and the whole topic of pricing and selling is, is a really live one. But really, there's something else which I'd like you to think about, which actually is a sort of meta, meta topic, um, and it's a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, which is, which is process, the way by which you, you do these things. Uh, and that's what I'd like to focus on uh, a lot today. So one of the things I, I talk about a lot when I'm talking about scaling IoT is this spiral, which is really what happens as you start on the journey of scaling. So you, you, you go into trials, maybe you've got 100 uh, devices deployed, and then you're trying to grow to 1,000. And you may find in your early days that your, quite a lot of your early deployments don't work perfectly for some reason. Maybe the proposition isn't quite right. Maybe the technology has some teething troubles. Um, maybe the customers are unfamiliar with what you're doing. And um, that's okay. You know, if you've got um, if you've got a ten percent problem and you've got a hundred users, well, that's ten users. So with a small customer support team, you can deal with that no trouble. But as you then grow to a thousand users or ten thousand users, if you've still got a ten percent problem, that that number of users that are unhappy starts to grow to a, a number which is beyond the capability of your customer support team to smooth over the cracks. So as you grow, you end up going through this spiral of, of needing to improve your quality in order to scale. Otherwise, you'll have too many unhappy customers. And the interesting thing about this, and the reason that it's a spiral, is that the relationship actually goes the other way as well. Because it's very hard to increase your quality without increasing your scale. And the example I'll use for that is if you go into a wealthy person's house, you'll find often a lot of... Um, 
sort of wacky home automation technology. And you'll notice that most of it doesn't work properly. Um, I think this is a common factor that many of us will recognize. Uh, and the reason for that is that that home automation vendor doesn't have very many customers because there aren't that many very wealthy people in the world. And so they can't justify the investment in R&D to make their product really good because they don't have enough customers to amortize that cost against. Um, I'm seeing quite a lot of nodding heads, so I, I see you recognize that. So that's why you know it's very hard to improve scale without improving quality, and it's very hard to increase uh, quality without uh, increasing scale, and, and the two really go together. So when we're talking about quality, quality of what? Well, I think it really uh, groups into three sectors. The first one is, is simply technical delivery. You will probably have some, some hardware bugs in the early days. You'll probably have some software bugs. Um, and especially, I think, in the software realm, um, it's all about the stuff falling off what engineers sometimes call the happy path. Many IoT propositions are actually extremely simple in proposition. So if we think of a simple thing like a temperature sensor in a, in a hall like this, its job is simply to sample the air temperature and send that information to the cloud. That is a one-line application. That's a student project, okay? Um, it's not hard. Where it becomes hard is the fact that that sensor has to find the network in the first place and securely pair with it. It has to deal with interference. Uh, it will need upgrading, which introduces all sorts of interesting challenges. Um, and so if you look at the code inside that sensor and the amount of time and money that's spent on developing and maintaining that sensor, probably 95 to 99% of it has nothing whatsoever to do with the application. It has to do with all of this kind of hygiene factors of what happens if things don't work as expected, how do we recover, um, and how do we get back onto the happy path. Okay, so if we've got the technical stuff right, what about the proposition? Well, I think there's a couple of things there. The first is, especially if it's a new proposition, you may find that, that when your customers buy it, it doesn't quite do what they thought it did. So uh, when they saw the advertising, they had a, an understanding in their brain. And then when they experience the reality, that doesn't quite match. And that obviously can lead to them simply giving the product back. The other propositional thing is really ease of use. So if it's just not obvious to them how to make it do what it's supposed to do, uh, you'll get a lot of support calls, which will drive your costs. Uh, and that can drive churn. And this is particularly important because we all have more and more connected devices in our lives, in our homes, and in our offices. Uh, and um, so we only have a finite amount of uh, attention and knowledge, and that's being spread thinner and thinner across more and more devices, which means that devices need to look after themselves more and more as their numbers grow. And then the final piece, really, is this thing of process. So. What we notice at Device Pilot as we engage with companies that are going down their connected product journey is that they often start, especially if they are um, existing product companies that are now getting into IoT, is they often start with a very reactive customer support process because that's all you can do if you've got an offline product. You wait for the phone to ring, you, you listen for the problem, and you try and talk the customer through, you know, is the red light flashing, that kind of stuff. Um, that's an extremely reactive process. and. Uh, with IoT, you can really abandon that process. You can do much, much better than that. Um, you can move to a proactive process. You know, the product is connected. You should be able to see a problem happening before the customer even knows about it. I mean, this is one of the great opportunities of IoT, and a, a lot of people are not taking nearly enough advantage of it. And then beyond that is to really try and get people out of the equation entirely. If you can automate that support process, if you can automatically spot that a problem has happened and automatically resolve it, ideally before the customer even notices, then you're really flying. And, and interestingly, even if the customer does notice, if you solve the problem really well, you'll often find that a customer who's had a problem that you've solved quickly and effectively will become a bigger fan than a customer that's never had a problem because they've seen what you're made of. They've seen that you've thought ahead. And the other challenge from a process point of view is to decouple the number of devices from the number of people in your organization necessary to support those devices. So in the early days, you'll be doing um, support quite manually. And that's a good thing to do because you're learning from your early customers. Your early customers' value is not the revenue they give you. It's, the, it's what they teach you. But as you start to scale, it, you will start to notice if you carry on doing things that way that your operational costs, your people costs, are growing in tandem with your number of devices. And most IoT companies are aiming at very large markets of a million or more devices. And to get there, that means they have to grow very fast in a big exponential. And so if they're not careful, they'll find that the number of people to support the devices is also growing extremely fast and exponentially. And that is simply not sustainable. 
So I suppose just to put that in pictures, what I'm saying is that in the early days, your operations costs, mainly people, um, will track your number of devices. And that's okay. That's normal. But there comes a point where you have to level off the ops costs uh, away from the growing exponential number of devices. Uh, and really, the gap between the two is where your profit's going to come. And if you don't do that, uh, you may well make a loss. So when we're talking about quality and, and, and devices working and, and customer experience, one term that we use a lot at, at Device Pilot is availability. And what this basically is, is a measure of how many of your devices are working how much of the time. It's a very simple concept. But I just want to illustrate what that means with some examples. So here we have a week in time from left to right. Uh, and we have device number one. And we can see that device number one is not working very well. In fact, that's about 30% availability, um, which is not a very good customer experience. And it's, it's a very patchy thing. So that customer will almost certainly be really frustrated. Device number two also has 30% availability. But the interesting thing about this is that if we just looked at the last day, we see it's working very well. So if at any moment in time our ops team says, well, is this device working? They think it is. But actually, it's not working well enough you know, over time. So this is definitely a measure that you have to take over time. Let's look at device number three, working much better. That's about 90% availability. Great. But we can see it seems to have run into a problem. So something has suddenly happened. Maybe it's a, a, a radio reception problem or interference or something like that. Device number four also has 90% uh, availability. But there's actually a pattern here. I don't know if you can spot it, which is that it tends to fail around about midnight. Not always, but, but it fails much more around the middle of the night than it does at any other time. That's quite interesting. I wonder what's causing that. Maybe it's um, maybe someone closes a door at night and that changes the radio reception. Maybe a boiler fires up and, and the motor's causing interference. Lots of possible causes, but there's some interesting clues in that. And device number five. Well, device number five we never hear from during this week at all. And the important point about that is in order to know there's even a problem, we have to know that we have deployed a device, but we're not hearing anything from it. And it is quite amazing to me, uh, as we talk to connected product companies at Device Pilot, a very large number of companies we talk to do not know how many devices they've deployed. I mean, there is no more fundamental question than that, uh, and they don't know the answer. And so they can't even begin to kind of answer these kinds of questions. So if you're looking at that, uh, you might wonder, well, what's normal? Uh, and again, a device pilot, we have the privilege of working with lots of connected product companies, both B2B and B2C companies. And so we, we're getting a quite a good sense of what normal looks like in terms of availability. So I'm sorry, this chart probably looks a bit like a maths, maths test. But essentially what it's showing is along the bottom, we've got the number of devices growing exponentially. So from 100 devices to 100,000 devices and, and beyond. So it's a logarithmic chart. And up, up the uh, side, we've got the availability. And again, this is a, a sort of anti-logarithmic uh, number. So 10% up to 90%. So these are the numbers we were just looking at on the previous slide. But you can see that in every decade, we add what telco companies would call one more nine. So 99% is, is two nines availability. 99.9 .9 is three, and so on. So just for reference, telcos would typically aim at five nines availability, something like that, for their services. Some of Amazon's services, um, like S3, their storage service, claims that it achieves eight nines. How they measure that, I don't know, but quite amazing. Now, one of my colleagues at Device Pilot likes to say that one nine is a good day in IoT. Uh, and unfortunately, that is true, because there's a lot that can go wrong with IoT. And that's primarily because it's deployed into the real world. And the real world is an uncontrolled place. So it's very different from deploying a server into a server farm where it's in a nice air-conditioned room. Um, in, in IoT land, everything can and will happen. So this area here roughly shows what, um, uh, what, we, what we see in the real world as companies grow their scale. Um, and actually, B2C applications tend to, be, um, ha tend to have less variation and tend to be more in the middle of this area. B2B tend to be dotted about a lot more, probably because the use cases are very different and the types of connection are very different. Sometimes cellular, low power wide area, ethernet, whatever. Um, so often, you know, 100 units, that's probably trials. You might be, you know, 
I mean, we, we've even seen cases where people are only achieving 30 or 40 percent uh, availability in their trials, which is kind of not really good enough. Um, by the time you get to sort of a thousand, you're starting to scale. You do need to be getting sort of close to 90 percent, uh, and 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 it needs to go on going up. So just to translate those numbers into uh, sort of human numbers, um, if you've got 99.9% .9 availability, that means your thing is down for 43 minutes a month, uh, which if the user's not using it during that time, you might be able to get away with. 99%, um, seven hours a month. 90%, a couple of hours a week. Um, or another way of thinking about that is one in 10 uses. So personally, I've been using Sonos for a while uh, in my home, about four years. Uh, and when it came out, it was somewhere around about here. More often than not, when I went to use it, it didn't work for, because the broadband was down or my home network was down or the Sonos software had got, uh, got a bit excited. Um, nowadays, it's at about 90%. I reckon one in 10 times that I go to use it, it doesn't work properly, which is annoying, but it's kind of get good enough that I, you know, I carry on using it. Um, so they've still got work to do. Uh, by the way, if you're deploying a cellular connected device in the UK, and you can't control where it's deployed, you will be lucky to get more than about 92% availability. And that's mainly as a result of coverage. So you'll find some devices don't have any coverage and some have very, very patchy coverage, which means they go offline a lot. Um, so if we think about companies that have deployed to some kind of scale, um, and, and we go to perhaps what I think might be the worst conceivable performance, which is about 95% availability, um, what, what does that really mean? So, well, it, oops, sorry. It could mean um, that, uh, I mean, the best case is that 5,000 of our 100,000 customers have no service at all. Okay, that's the absolute best case, and it's not a realistic case. Much more likely is that 10,000 of our customers have 50% service, which is not good enough. So that's 10,000 unhappy customers. Uh, or it might mean that 50,000 customers have 90% service, which I said was just about tolerable for my Sonos system. So you can see, actually, you know, these numbers um, need to be a lot better than you might think in order for you to have uh, the majority of your customers being happy. So I suppose a big message uh, in a show like this is um, that you're not alone. Um, I've worked in new markets all my life uh, doing innovation. And I'm quite familiar with some of the dynamics that happen in early markets. And I think IoT is still an early market. It's just starting to, to, to not be an early market anymore. Um, but I think one of the interesting things about early markets is that they're very collaborative. They're not head-to-head -head competitive generally. You'll find a lot of people working together to jointly deliver solutions to their customers to make sure there are complete solutions with no gaps and that everything works well together. And so everybody's motivated by the desire to make the market grow to their mutual advantage. When the market matures, it then does become more of a zero-sum game with head-to-head -head competition, but we're a long way from that in IoT. So I suppose one of my key uh, messages, really, if you're building an IoT solution or scaling one, is to think hard about outsourcing. As more and more vendors come into the space, you can outsource to partners, so you can take pieces of your solution that perhaps you didn't want to do anyway uh, and hand them off to partners who might do them better, and that allows you to focus on what you're really good at. And you can also look to outsource pieces of your infrastructure downwards to the vendors who are um, supplying to you. So maybe in, in the early days you had to, to write more software than you wanted because there wasn't anything out there that did the job. Um, but then you'll notice that vendors like AWS start to provide the components that everyone wants for IoT. Uh, and so you can move to using them and you'll find that they're much, um, much better and much cheaper once you've taken the development and operations costs into account. IoT is starting to have quite interesting long value chains. If you look all the way from people who make chip IP through to modules, through to products, through to solutions, and, and eventually, eventually to the end user, which might be a, a local council for a smart city solution or whatever, quite long value chains. I think the way to think about these things, though, is more as value webs than value chains. If you look at any one player in that, including you, you will have multiple vendors supplying you, and you're probably supplying multiple customers. So actually, it, it is a web, it's not a chain, it's not linear. Um, and from any position, it might look like you're in the middle of it. Um, but, but of course, no one's in the middle of it. It is, it is a big connected web. I think I've talked about the fact that eventually the market will become competitive. And so we all have a window of opportunity to become really good at one thing before that happens and, and establish a, a defensible position. Um, 
And of course, the other thing that starts to happen at that point is commoditization from the bottom up. So those vendors who are providing pieces of infrastructure will gradually um, you know, make those pieces more and more functional and climb up the value chain. And you may have to climb up above them in order to, to retain your revenue. So I suppose really my, my kind of key message is to consider buying everything except your unique selling point, um, the thing that only you know how to do. Uh, and really, you could describe that as spending less time doing. A lot of connected product companies that I see that I think are in trouble uh, are in trouble because they're simply trying to do too much. Everyone in the company is rushing around trying to do 10 different things and doing them badly. Uh, and that's not a recipe for success. So increasingly, it's possible to find vendors who are providing the pieces you need and then you can specify what you need, you can select the vendors, and you can test and, and accept uh, the performance of the solutions and, and spend your time doing that instead of trying to build them yourself. And by the way, your customers are going to be doing that to you too, so you need to demonstrate why you're better uh, than alternatives. You probably have already built too much. You've probably already written too much code. You may have built your own devices when maybe nowadays you wouldn't need to. Uh, and I think it's fine to throw stuff away. Uh, I don't see software and I don't see code as an investment. I see it as a necessity and the, the sooner you can throw it away, the better. Uh, nobody in your company should be precious about doing that. The other thing you can throw away is responsibilities and serverless, which you've probably heard about in the cloud, uh, is an example of that, which is very relevant to IoT. It allows you to throw away a lot of the, the kind of DevOps responsibilities. Um, you don't have to worry about disks filling up and uh, so on. Um, and provisioning and so on. Um, and uh, the, the net result of that usually is, is to massively reduce your operational costs and increase your performance. So I suppose in, in a nutshell, you know, the way people used to build IoT solutions was very monolithic. They used to build everything themselves in a very isolated way. Uh, the net result of that often was that their stuff didn't work with anyone else's stuff, which is not good for them or anyone else. Um, these days, um, you know, in IoT, as with the web or anything else, it's much more normal to compose your IoT solution largely out of off-the-shelf pieces of hardware and software and so on, uh, and spend your time just working on your unique selling point, the bit that makes you different, and buying in everything else and integrating it. So, IoT happiness, I think, comes really from three things. The first and foremost, obviously, is your customer's experience. And as the market matures, that's the thing you must ensure is good. The second one, obviously, is scaling. You're going to have to sell hundreds and thousands and eventually millions of devices. And, and the challenges of scaling you know, are continuous and different at every scale. And the third thing, of course, is costs. You need to manage your costs to make yourself profitable. If you're venture funded, that might not be urgent, but it's certainly important in the long term. So these, these three things, everyone in your company will be working on these three things one way or another, whether they're writing code or working on sales marketing or anything. You know, everyone affects all of these things. But you need to have owners. You need to have people who are responsible for making sure they happen and they happen well. So who are those people? Well, the CEO really has ultimate responsibility for scaling. The CFO obviously has responsibility for costs. So who has responsibility for customer experience? Well, actually, I think it divides really into two often. In modern companies, you often have someone responsible for the proposition and someone else responsible for the delivery of that proposition. And normally, the product manager is this very influential role in digital companies. They're responsible for defining what the product is supposed to do and why it's supposed to make the customer happy and, and learning as, as you evolve what, uh, you know, what it needs to do. And then the COO or the operations team, service assurance manager, network assurance manager, lots of different names for it. But that's the person who's responsible for making sure that that proposition is delivered consistently with high availability to all your customers. So I think to achieve all of this, the, the, the spiral of quality and scaling and all the other things I've talked about, you really, I think, need four things. The first thing is visibility for everyone in your company to be able to ask any question of your device estate at any point and get an immediate answer. What, how many devices have we deployed? Where are they? What software are they running? What hardware are they, uh, versions are they? Um, and so on. Second question, once you know the answer to that, is how many of them are working? If you don't know the answer to that, it's probably not a good one. It's time you found out. Um, are the numbers getting better? Are they getting worse? Which devices are not working? When you, when you know that, then the next question is, well, why are the devices that are not working not working? Is it a problem with software, connectivity, battery, temperature? Could be almost anything. And then the final thing, which is to do with scaling, really, is automation. 
So as you support devices and customers through their life cycle, your operations team, your customer support team will be doing some things again and again. Whenever a human is doing something again and again, there's an opportunity to automate it and thereby do it quicker, more consistently, and make your operations team far more productive and therefore lower your cost. So it may not surprise you to know that these really are the four features of Device Pilot as a service. So coming back to my original question, um, what is so hard about IoT? Well, hopefully I've, I've tried to illustrate some of those things. I think the answer really in a nutshell is to outsource the undifferentiated heavy lifting. So that's a Jeff Bezos quote. So all the pieces that you need to deliver your solution, but which are not unique to your solution, um, to outsource them really to, to partners and to vendors. So you can focus on doing the one thing you do uh, uniquely really, really well. Thanks very much indeed.